Hey, welcome back to a new installment of the Wide Ride Podcast. I'm Manny Navarro, college football and Miami Hurricanes writer for The Athletic. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, closing in on 2 p.m. I know it's been a while since we've had an episode here on the show. Miami is two-thirds of the way through spring practices. And you'll notice that today I've got a new uh, co-host with me today. That's Adam Lichtenstein from the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Uh, Carlos Ledo is busy in tax season, so he's usually here to uh, make jokes and make you laugh. Adam's going to try his best today to do that. Uh, Adam, uh, welcome to Wide Right. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. A long-time listener, first-time co-host. <laughs> well, thank you for doing this. And uh, I want the, you know, we're going to talk a lot about what's going on at Miami. You've been down there a lot more than I have. I think I've been down there maybe for four practices, at least that I've been able to watch. They've had 10 already of, of the 15. Uh, spring game is right around the corner, uh, April 13th. I believe it will be televised at four o'clock on ACC Network, if I've got that right. Um, they'll, they'll do sort of an hour block with the hurricanes where you'll get to watch them. If you're, if you're unable to get down to Cobb stadium, uh, as, as a listener and a fan. Um, but Adam, you know, I wanted to start off by talking about, you know, some of your impressions. You've been down there again, a lot more than I have been there for a bunch of interviews, written a ton of really good stories. I know, um, you wrote about, um, Cam McCormick, uh, you know, uh, who's now in his 25th season of college football, it feels like. Uh, you, you've written a lot of good feature stories on these guys. Um, but let's start big picture um, with the Canes. What sort of robs you the most? If you had to tell somebody this is the biggest, my biggest takeaway from the first 10 practices, what is it? Um, well, I'd say like about a week ago, I wrote an article, kind of like a position by position look at how things have just kind of looked and seemed during spring practice. And I'm going position by position, and I'm like, this is a pretty good team. Uh, there's not a lot of positions that I'd say are, you know, have a lot of holes. Uh, there's a couple that are obvious that stand out, like the secondary primarily, but especially on offense, they seem pretty good. Like, they seem, like, the depth seems all right, like, with the exception of, like, one or two places. Um, and I just think the team is really solid. Now, maybe I'm I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, and, you know, I know the last couple <laughs> of years, the last couple of years I thought they were going to be better than they ended up being. So, you know, you could take that with, a grain of salt but like there's really not a lot of positions where i'm like oh yeah they need a lot of work there because they seem to have you know good players and, and depth and talent at pretty much every position yeah i mean i think on paper certainly they've addressed a lot of important needs right the last couple seasons mario's basically completely flipped the roster this is his third year going on his third year in charge and I, and I think, you know, there aren't very many Manny Diaz guys left, right? I mean, it, it's it's basically Mario's team now, almost 95%. Um, I think, you know, you, if you look up and down the roster, there's a few guys, obviously, that came here under Manny. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I mean, these are all guys that have, that have now been coached by Mario for t going on two years, if not, you know, three years, right, when he, when he first got here. So um you're right i think this this roster has been upgraded in a lot of places i think secondary is certainly the, the the spot we all sort of look at and say okay i guess in the transfer portal they might go look for a safety they might go look for a corner another cornerback to try to help solidify that position um we'll talk about you know some of that stuff i addressed that and, and actually my story today in the athletic one of the few miami hurricane stories i've written since uh <laughs> the first day of camp when i was out there to see cam ward in person and was really blown away but that leads me to really to what i think has been you know from a player perspective and, and talking to former players guys who have been out there to watch Miami practice I said what's the biggest thing that they that they draw not only is the team more talented but I think ultimately Cam Ward's impact is really really felt and he's he's sort of viewed as man this guy is a legit quarterback maybe an NFL guy uh maybe the best quarterbacks Miami Miami has had since Ken, Ken Dorsey was around certainly I think Derek King deserves a nod right for what he was able to do but you know, big picture wise, I think there's a lot of excitement over Cam Ward. And I think Adam agree, agree or disagree with me. I think Miami season is going to all depend on how good Cam Ward really is. Oh, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. I mean, we saw last year where a quarterback will take you because I think last year's team was a pretty solid team. And the weeks they didn't have good quarterback play are the weeks they lost. You know, they lost to FSU when Emory Williams was playing for Tyler Van Dyke and he struggled for most of the game. They lost that game. They lost to uh, NC State where Tyler Van Dyke struggled. They lost Georgia Tech for a few reasons, but it, one of them being that Tyler Van Dyke struggled. So, you know, we can see where a good quarterback can take you. And I think Cam Ward is a very, very good quarterback. I, you know, we, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a scout or a talent <laughs> evaluator. I'm, I'm just a writer, but he looks pretty good to me, you know, in, in what we see in practice and talking to 
coaches and players and everyone around the program, everyone's excited by him. Everyone loves his physical attributes. He loves his arm, his ability to run and, you know, make things happen when, if he's flushed out of the pocket, obviously he's not getting hit in practice or anything, but, you know, if he has to move, he can move. And, and people have been raving about his leadership, which, you know, is an intangible thing that, you know, there's not a scale grade for that or anything, but it's something you want in your quarterback and Cam Ward seems to have it. Uh, a lot of people, you know, talk about the, uh, the very ballyhooed dinner with the offensive linemen, which <laughs> yep. um, I, I joked and I said, Oh, you know, the over under for that's like $700 and then immediately realized my mistake that it would be way much more money than that. Um, as yeah. many people on, on Twitter told me, um, <laughs> but yeah, he just seems like, you know, everyone seems to have taken to him very quickly. You know, I've, I've seen, Instagram stories of like, you know, the players hanging out, you know, I remember at pro day, he was hanging out with some other players who were there. So, I mean, it's been nothing but positives about him. And uh, if he's, if he's as good as advertised, like he'll carry this team. Yeah. We're going to get back into football in a second. We're going to discuss, uh, we, we actually asked for questions uh, uh, in, on Twitter here for a mailbag. So we'll have plenty of, of stuff on there. We'll talk a little bit of recruiting probably too. Um, um, but I want to kind of tease some other subjects. And then I also want to get to, I want our, our listeners to get to know you a little bit, Adam, because you've been on the Hurricanes beat now for what is this? This is year three, year four for you? Yeah, going into year three. Going into year three for you. So um, I know you're you're a Florida graduate, correct? University of Florida graduate. And you're originally yep. from the New York area, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I moved down to Florida when I was like five years old. Yeah, so uh, you know South Florida well, but you, you do have those Yankees roots, right? Those Yankee uh, rooting interests for sure. And uh, although I see you with the Marlins cap, hopefully, hopefully they can finally get a win uh, <laughs> uh, and end this 0 for 6 start that they've gotten. But uh, uh, just tell people a little bit about yourself, man, and how long you know you've been doing this, how, why you got into journalism, and and what maybe you like about covering the Hurricanes. Yeah, so uh, like you said, I uh, I grew up in South Florida, Palm Beach County. Um, went to the University of Florida. Um, got into journalism when I was there. I was very lucky because I, I, when I got to UF, I was majoring in sports management. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like I would tell people I want to be the general manager of the New York Yankees. And um, I realized about <laughs> half, it was about halfway through my freshman, first freshman semester that I'm like, that's probably not a great career goal because there's only one of those and it's been the same guy for almost 30 years now. Um, so I was like, what else do I like to do? And I've been on my high school paper, mostly to help out a friend. So I'm like, let me give journalism a shot. And I got very lucky that I, I kind of stumbled into a great journalism school with a great student paper, uh, started covering sports for the student paper, the independent Florida alligator, you know, did, did a little bit of everything, soccer, uh, tennis, softball, uh, and then baseball and football, covered the Gators. It's, what's funny is uh, my junior year at Florida, I got there year one post Tebow. So they were not very good my first couple of years. The third year I was here, I was there, um, was Will Muschamp's one good season. They made the Sugar Bowl, were very close to playing for a national title. Um, and I, you know, through like working my way up, I covered the team the following year. And I thought, okay, this is going to be great. You know, I'm going to get the chance to cover a Sugar Bowl or an SEC title game, maybe even a national title game. And then they had their worst season in 30 years and went four and eight and lost to Georgia Southern. Um, so it was definitely a memorable year for other reasons, but, um, but yeah, I did that intern to MLB.com. Uh, looks, I love baseball. Baseball is my favorite sport. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, kind of covered preps in the area for, for a while uh, for the Sun Sentinel and the Palm Beach post got promoted to the hurricanes beat a couple years ago and really, really love it. I, I love college football so much. Like it's so much fun getting a chance to see uh, different environments, different college environments, um, you know, get a chance to experience and be around the sport. Um, it's just a really fun sport. I think it's rid a ridiculous sport, which is part of why I love it. Yeah. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. Something, <laughs> something weird happens. Like it seems like every week, something weird or crazy or stupid happens. And I, and I love it. And I know people, people give me crap for being a Gator covering the hurricanes. Um, it's not an issue for me. Uh, I know I talked about this, I think on the orange bowl boys podcast a little while ago, but like, uh, when I was at Florida, and I was on the student paper. They like they bullied you into you are not a fan anymore. You cannot be a fan. Like if we posted something on Facebook or Twitter, like wearing a Gator shirt or something, like you got in trouble. Uh, like with the editors at the paper and stuff. So yeah. they kind of like bullied that out of me. Uh, and when <laughs> once you once you do that, you kind of like it's hard to get back to where you were as like, just a pure fan and stuff. So even like after I wasn't covering them anymore for at the student paper, I like wasn't really at, I wasn't a fan in the same way. And then. You know, when I was I started covering the Hurricanes, I said, OK, well, that's the end of being a Gators fan. Like, that's fine. I can like it's not a problem. So like even and even if I wanted to be like a Gators fan, 
I don't have time. Like I don't get to watch them a lot. Like I'm at <laughs> right. I'm at the Hurricanes games every Saturday, you know. So it's like I don't get a chance to watch them even if I wanted to. Like I st- my wife's a, a UF alum as well, so like we, you know, I keep up with them a little bit and I see what's going on. And if I'm home, you know, for a Gators game, I'll watch it. But like I just, it's not like I'll always have something in my heart for the school and like especially the student paper. But like I don't care what happens to the the football team and like I'm sure Billy Napier's gonna get fired this year. So like. Uh, I people people ask me about that and some people ask me about it like as a question and people are like other people are like oh you're a gator you just you hate um and I'm like no I don't like <laughs> it's very no hard bearing. for fans to get over that right yeah to just, yeah to, to just really know better and it's funny because I get accused of being a Florida State fan even though I never went to Florida State uh, even though I always rooted for the Hurricanes as a kid growing up in South Florida uh, and went to the Orange Bowl and was and was there as a kid to see. Uh, you know, the wide right games and, and uh, you know, was super happy when Miami won the national championship uh, in 2001 to see them sort of climb back up the ladder. But at, just like you, Adam, as a journalist, as somebody who was in a newsroom since 1995 at the Miami Herald, it basically got beat out of me, the fandom, right? Like it it just, it, this is a profession where, as I learned through working with Dan Lebetard for many years, you root for the story. You root for what is going to make the best read, right? What is going to be the most interesting story? Um, people would say, well, you're, you're talking about clicks. It's not even clicks. Like, I just want to write an interesting and fun yeah. story. I want I want whatever is going to be the best story. Um, and that's really what I root for nowadays uh, when I'm on deadline or when I'm when I'm sitting there at a, at a game watching. Uh, last year for me, I was happy Florida State won 13-0. I had to go cover FSU uh, once or twice and, and was around them. And and it was a great comeback story after everything they'd been through, right? For Mike Norvell to sort of right the ship. And so maybe that's what made people believe I was a Florida State fan. But the honest to God truth is, Adam, for you and I both, if Miami were to have a spectacular season this year right for us. And, and and make the college football playoff and be and make like you and I would be jumping up and down because yeah. that's great for us as journalists. Mm-hmm. It absolutely I, the, is. What, what, the one thing I root for, the only thing I root for on game day is that the game doesn't come down to the last second because that happened a lot <laughs> last year. I tell people the story of like my like, for the Georgia Tech game, like my story was done, done. Yeah. And then you know the the you know Mario doesn't take a knee and all that, and Don Chaney fumbles. Maybe he doesn't. So I'm like changing my story as that's happening. Um, after they score, like I'm like, but they're not. Georgia Tech hasn't done anything on offense. They're not gonna win. Like this game, it's gonna be a weird a weird hiccup. Then they score, and luckily there was a review, gave me an extra minute to like change some things around. I hit publish, but I never changed my headline. Oh, so it wow. still said like it still said hurricanes like survive mistakes or whatever, and then. I realized like as it was uploading the story and I was able to change it before it actually went online. But yeah, what I root for, I root for a blowout, whether it's <laughs> Miami, Miami 49, 10, or, you know, NC state 49, 10, just let me be done with my story. Like halfway through the fourth quarter. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that that's always the easiest thing, but at the same time too, uh, now that I work for the athletic and we're not really writing on deadline as much anymore, I, I, I like the drama, you know, writing yeah. about what happened with, you know, not taking a knee against Georgia Tech. People ate that story up. They yeah. they wanted to know more and more about it. And and so I write it from a little different perspective than I used to when I when I worked for the papers. But I know that pain and, and I learned <laughs> and I struggled through it covering the Miami Heat uh, for three seasons and being on deadline and NBA games is just absolutely rough covering the Marlins for seven years, mm-hmm. it, you know, especially with that bullpen and how many leads <laughs> they blew, uh, over the years when I was covering them. So I know what it's like to have to sit there and rewrite and it's not fun. So I totally get where you're coming from. The, the number, hope- the number, the number of game store. I would, I could write a book with, and I'm sure you could too. <laughs> the number of game stories and stuff that never saw the light of day. Cause he had to change up in the last minute. Oh, yeah. Like, you just write a book on that, like game, the games that weren't or whatever. The games that weren't. That's it. I like that. I like that. Well, hopefully for Miami this year, there's a lot more W's and, you know, the fan base here after what I feel has really been, you know, two decades of suffering uh, watching this program sort of meander into mediocrity that Cam Ward and Mario Cristobal uh, have the kind of season that's really needed down here. Because, Adam, to be honest with you, and, and, and again, and we're kind of talking big picture here. You look at the way college football has evolved, right? The Big Ten, the SEC, everybody's talking about how much money they're making off of their TV deals. Everybody's talking about college athletes getting paid uh, through NIL, maybe eventually becoming employees. We see what's going on with the ACC, and it's a little scary, right, for Miami. Um, And and I think this is a golden opportunity right now, the way Mario Cristobal is recruiting, where he's got back-to-back uh, top seven ranked recruiting classes. He goes out and he has he has a strong NIL signing class led by Cam Ward that he can piece it together because I don't know how many more seasons of mediocrity Miami could survive the way college football is changing. 
Yeah, no, I agree. Because if you're the if you're the Big Ten, if you're the SEC, and you're looking at what schools we can add in this in this turf war where they eventually become like a big two, my you need to have a, a premier or at least a good um showcase program, whether it's it's fo- probably football. I mean, most, I don't think they really want to add a lot of premier basketball programs unless they're like UNC or Duke. But uh, Miami needs to show that, like, hey, we are still a big boy. And they've put their money where their mouth is so far. Like, I know you, I wasn't covering the team yet when they started making all the changes with, you know, putting more funds in and hiring Mario, her- hiring Dan Radakovich and, you know, putting more money into facilities and stuff. Like, that was like the very beginning of my time on the beater before I got here. But they've committed resources to the program and they need to start seeing some fruits of that. And I, I think we will this year. Uh, but they, like you said, they need to start kind of putting on a show to show that the, these other conferences that Miami is still a valuable property because the SEC is already in Florida. They have Florida, uh, the big 10, presumably if they're going to add FSU. They'll be in the state. They'll have that, that, you know, connection to Florida for recruiting purposes. Not that SEC schools need help recruiting Florida, but, um, for recruiting purposes, for TV purposes and all that jazz, like they'll have the market. So Miami has to prove that it's a big boy. Yeah. I, I just finished doing a kind of a unique story for the athletic. It's actually going to be a series, uh, but I picked an all state team uh, for the state of Florida uh, for the modern era of recruiting, which is, which essentially is 2002 uh, to current day. Um, and that's basically since rivals and two, four, seven and ESPN and all the websites sort of, created these online rankings that people have been able to, to poke and prod. And if you want to tell the story of what's happened to the University of Miami football program, well, just go look and see who actually made the all Florida team and look at what colleges they went to. Alabama absolutely dominates this team that was selected. There's only one hurricane among the 26 players that were selected. And that was Devin Hester in 2002. He was a 2002 high school recruit out of Riviera Beach, Suncoast. I was there, by the way, this is how old I am, Adam. I was there to watch Devin Hester run track in the state championships as a junior. OK, mm-hmm. so I was there to, to, to see Devin Hester before he became the most prolific return man in college football and, in, and, and pro football, essentially. Um, but that's a lot, that's the only hurricane that made our list. We're going to do an all, all state Georgia team, Alabama, Texas, California. I'm in the middle of, do, of researching all that kind of stuff. But I guess I'm going to move this forward um, as I tease that story for, for my listeners uh, by asking you if we had to pick uh, potential hurricane candidates to make a future All-State team. Let's say we were going to do it from 2020 on, right? From the 2020s on. Who on this team right now would you say, and I'm talking about in-state recruits, guys that came out of South Florida. We're uh, not counting IMG. We're, 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 not if they didn't come out of the state of Florida. We we, we look we, we go and look at hometowns. Um, uh, if there are guys on this roster that you say, yeah, they could make an All-State team, who is it? Um, well, I, I think the first guy that stands out is the obvious one. It's, it's Ruben Bain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he has had a great freshman year. He's got the the talent. He's got the mind, like the mentality to be a great player. He could, he's he got the versatility that he'll get on the field. Because, like, you know, instead of being pigeonholed as a end or uh, a tackle, he could probably play both. Um, so I, I think he by the time he leaves Miami, whether that's after next year or the year after, though, probably after next year, um, or 2025, uh, I think he'll be uh, among the best defensive linemen to come out of, you know, the Florida, come out of Florida in, the, in recent in recent times. Like, I think he has the ability to be very, very special. Um, in terms of other guys from Miami who are from Florida, uh, JoJo Trader stands out. You know, I watched yeah. him a lot in high school, um, and he kind of got overshadowed a bit by Jeremiah Smith, who no doubt. I think, I mean, Jeremiah Smith might just be the best high school player I've, <laughs> I've ever seen. Um, I don't have I know you, you'll probably go back and see guys like Willie, Willie Williams and stuff like that and some other guys. But uh, in my time watching high school football down here the last like nine or so years, Jeremiah Smith is just outstanding. But um, Jojo Trader is is pretty much as good. He's got great hands. He's a very talented route runner. Um, I have visions of him, you know, even this year, just scoring little, you know, eight yard slants for touchdowns, uh, just running perfect routes and, and just grabbing the ball out of the out of the air like. I think he has the ability to be a special player. Uh, who else from Florida? Ruben Bain. Wesley Bethan- I don't know if Wesley Bethan would make like an all South Florida probably team, but I not. think probably yeah. not, but he, I think he'll be good. Um, Maybe I'm blanking on somebody. Well, the really, the only reason I bring this up is we came up 
with two names. And those are the two names I would have come up with as well, by the way. Um, it just shows you, right, like how far along Miami still has to go in terms of rebuilding this, right? Like I, I, that's part of the reason why I brought it up because there just really aren't many examples of Mario, this is so far, getting big time in-state kids, you know, guys that are Florida born um, to, to come here and, and to become major contributors and to develop. So we're still very early in this process, which is why when Miami fans are always like, man, it's year three, he should be winning already. Like, no, he's got a 10 year contract for a reason. Like this is a long build. I think of Jim Harbaugh at Michigan and how long it took him to turn Michigan back into winner. I think ultimately that's probably how long it'll take Mario if he can continue to recruit at this sort of elite level. And and that's the only reason I bring it up because it, it's, I think, you know, we always look at it so sort of like with a microscope, we never sort of take the macro look. And I think the fact that you and I can sit here and say, man, um, Ruben Bain and Jojo Trader might be the only two guys who, who could be on a future team. It still tells you there's work to be done. Yeah. And, and it all depends on what you consider success for the Mario Cristobal era or experiment at Miami is winning the ACC. And that's it. Success mm -hmm. is going to ten, like if they go 10 and two this year and I uh, pick your two losses, maybe they lose a stupid one or they lose to Louisville or something like that. Go 10 and two. They, they, but they go to the ACC title game and win that and make the playoffs and lose in the first round or something like, is that success is making the playoffs success in a 12 step team forward. playoff era? A step forward. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, right. And I, I agree. And I think it's a big step forward. And, uh, if, if you consider that like a successful tenure, then I think that's within reach. I think it's within reach soon. I think it might be within reach this year. Um, if you consider success like a Jim Harbaugh, like a, the Jim Harbaugh era at Michigan, where they built slowly and eventually reached the pinnacle of the sport this year, won the national title, you know, that's something that very few guys do. And we'll see if Cristobal ever gets there. But I think he has the ability to get to or compete for that. Um, I don't know if he'll ever win a national title at Miami, but I think he definitely can reach those levels of success that Miami hasn't had in 20 years, or at least mm -hmm. close to it. He can win a conference title. Um, I think he can, you know, in the play in a 12 team era or 12 team playoff, I think he'll get there. Like if I, I, I was saying a year ago, two years ago, if I had to put money on it, will Mario Cristobal ever make a 12 team playoff at Miami? I'd say yes, and I still would say yes. Um, I I, I think, like you said, we're kind of at the beginning of that where. This is where you'd want to see that kind of that next step, that ramp up to. Yeah, this is a com a competitive team in the conference, a competitive team, you know, that can make the playoff, win a win a game in the playoffs. We'll see who they, you know, it all depends on matchups. If they get matched up with, I don't know, just picking a team out of nowhere, Ole Miss or something, you know, a good team that's not a super team, you know, then it's a good game, and you know, they maybe they win it. Who knows? But I, this is where you want to see that that kind of ramp up and that that next step. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, let's dive back into the team uh, since we've hit on a lot of fun subjects. Uh, the biggest development to me, and, and I, I did a lot of like pre-camp lists. I did the 24 best returning players. I did the 11 best roster additions, counting transfers and freshmen that they that they went out and got. Uh, the one guy I didn't have on my list, on either one of those lists, was Elijah Lofton. And I think he's really been, I, I don't want to call him the surprise of camp, but certainly like somebody that I don't think we saw maybe having this much of an expanded role. I think we all sort of thought, well, he'll come in. He might do some H back stuff. He might, you know, play some tight end behind Elijah Royo and, you know, Riley Williams and some of the other guys, but the way Mario talked about him uh, last week when he did his last interview, I mean, for him to sort of compare him to Ruben Bain and, and, you know, CC Maui Goa and say, Hey, he can be one of those kind of freshmen was a little eye opening for me. Yeah, for sure. I actually, I wrote about him today. Uh, I don't know if it's, it, I don't think it's online yet, but it probably will be when uh, this goes up online. Uh, but yeah, no, exactly. I think the first play I saw him line up in on one-on-ones, the first day of practice, um, he was up, up against a walk-on like linebacker or, or DB, but he just shoved the kid to the ground and just blew past him for a catch in one-on-ones. And I was like, okay, I see you. Um, and yeah, he's, he's looked very good in practice from what we've seen. And, uh, you know, it seems like every day, you know, he makes some kind of circus catch or a one-handed grab or something. Seems like a very talented guy. And like you said, yeah, can play H-back. I think Riley Williams said the other day that, like, he's lined up in the slot a few times. Like, very versatile guy, very talented. Um, and, yeah, everyone's raved about him. You know, all the other tight ends have raved about him. Um, the coaches, uh, I know, like you said, Mario's spoken very highly of him, uh, comparing him to, to Francis Maui Noah and, and Ruben Bain. That's you know, pretty high praise. Those were guys who were freshmen, all American and everything like, 
And if Lofton, if they're going to use him that much, uh, he could do that from the way they're talking about him. I don't know if he's going to get on the field quite enough to maybe, you know, reach that, but because they've got such a, a deep tight end room uh, with so many guys competing for playing time. But I think he can definitely make some things happen and be kind of a change of pace guy and definitely someone to watch this year. Yeah, I, I kind of made a comparison to somebody who I know who came out of South Florida and, and was actually a pretty impactful player at West Virginia or has been a pretty impactful player at West Virginia the last two years, CJ Donaldson, mm -hmm. um, you know, who was sort of a tight end, big, big running back type of prospect coming out of out of Gulliver Prep. And here's a guy who I think most people didn't think he would become the number one running back at West Virginia, but he has and he's you know, run for, uh, I don't know, close to 1,500 yards and, and 19 touchdowns in two seasons, averaging 5.1 yards per carry. I think Miami's running back situation, while Mario did say Mark Fletcher, he expects Mark Fletcher back for the beginning of the summer, I think it's a very sort of precarious position, right, where Miami is probably going to go out and land uh, a very good running back out of the portal. It's, it's what I've heard they're probably going to do anyway. Um and if not, and if Fletcher's not healthy, maybe the door opens up for Elijah Lofton to be the number one running back on this team. And that's something we don't know. But Lofton certainly has the experience. He did it at Gorman. Adam, when we talk about running back, what what sort of crosses your mind? Do you, do you consider it another sort of precarious position, or do you think there's enough on the roster right now? Uh, I think, well, the staff, I don't know if we'll know the answer to that question. I think the staff will know the answer to that question in like two months. Because I think if Mark Fletcher and A.J. Allen are healthy and ready to go for fall, I think they're pretty much fine. If they're not, they're, they have a setback or they're not quite ready to go or not at 100%, then it's precarious. Because, I mean, I love Mark Fletcher. I've been watching him since he was in high school. Always loved him as a back. Great kid. Like, And I think he is a guy, if he's healthy, really poised for a potential breakout year this year. A.J. Allen, very good change of pace kind of guy. Very good guy to come in, you know, 10 times, 15 times, run the ball 10, 15 times a game or something and, and get in there. And then I like Chris Johnson. He's got insane speed. Um, but after that, you know, the depth starts to uh, get a little, little thinner than you'd want because then you have like Jordan Lyle and Chris Wheatley Humphrey who are freshmen and, and they're talented, but like how much do you want to rely on, you know, freshman running backs if a guy gets hurt and stuff like that. So the problem is, is like how, who, how, what do you sell a transfer running back on, you know? Because if they're if they're if Fletcher and Allen are healthy, those are probably one and two, you know. Or maybe you bring in another running back, but you bring him in to be the second running back, like the number two guy. Right. How, how do you you know how do you get somebody who's talented enough to be very good, but you know still open to being not the feature back, you know? Right. And, and that becomes an interesting recruiting perspective, and maybe that's where nil money comes in. Who knows? But that's kind of like where they're kind of in a weird spot where it's like they could have some very good backs who could take the load. But if you want to bring in a transfer that and a good transfer, not just depth, then, you know, how do you sell that to them? And that's kind of the weird position I think they're in with running back. I think they're going to definitely look for one. But like the question is, like, are you just looking for a depth piece, like a Lucia Stanley kind of guy who will take some reps when you're beating like Bethune Cookman or something? Or, you know, do you want a guy who can carry the ball? 200 times in the season or, you know, a hundred times a season or something like that and get significant reps. And it's like, how do you sell a guy talented enough to get a lot of reps when they might not get the feature, like the number one amount of carries? It's like a weird spot they're in. It is. And I think that's why it's sort of an interesting thing because while Mario has said he expects Mark Fletcher to be back and I, and I was been told by people close to Fletcher that he will be fine, that he will be able to come back from this injury and play for Miami this year. I also think it's smart for Mario to want some insurance and, you know, Trevante citizen is coming off of two, you know, missing two seasons with very serious knee injuries. Uh, AJ Allen is, is sort of very similarly built to Henry Parrish. Uh, yes, he's a good back, but on the smaller side, more of the change of pace guy. Uh, I spoke with Brian Monroe and Malik Rozier, two former Canes who, uh, we're out at, at, at practices this spring. Both of them told me that Chris Johnson is really explosive. They like him a lot, but that he still needs to learn some of his blocking assignments and 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 little be a little bit better in terms of route running. So um, 
I think it's 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 going to be very interesting to see what Miami does. But I think if I were to rank them, I think running back is number one. Then I think there's probably going to be some some departures from other positions. Um, the one I'm worried about is cornerback. I know the, I know most fans are, are saying, why are you bringing this up? But Damari Brown's brother did transfer to Florida State. Damari Brown also has not been practicing all of spring. And, you know, you can say it's an injury. You can say what it is. Uh, but I'm not going to sleep easy until Damari Brown is starting for Miami against Florida on August 31st because it is college football. This is the new world we live in, and the transfer portal window is going to be open from April 15th to April 30th, and guys can decide to leave for whatever reason. So I think cornerback is one they're certainly going to be looking at. I think edge rusher, I think there's some guys that could potentially leave at that position, guys that are sort of buried on the depth chart or, or, or you know, where you, where you might just need a little bit more depth. Uh, so I think those are all sort of areas – that and and if Miami can really go out and get a true number one receiver, I know we love Xavier Restrepo and we liked what Jacoby George did when he wasn't getting personal foul penalties, uh, Adam. But um, you know, and and JoJo Trader has a bright future, so does Nikar. But man, wouldn't you love to have that senior who's had a thousand yards receiving? Because that's sort of what elevates you, I think, from hey, this is an 8-9 win team to, hey, maybe this is a team that wins the ACC with a true number one receiver. Again, will Miami spend the money? Will it rock the roster and guys want to leave? All those are interesting questions, but I think that's another position where they could potentially add somebody to. Yeah, I agree. I mean, wide receiver, like like losing Colby Young. I like Colby Young as a receiver. He didn't have an amazing year last year, but he was he was good. Um, if you can find a better outside receiver than Isaiah Horton, then I think you got to go for it because you've got Cam Ward for a year. Like you just need to put the resources where you can, if you can get a guy, if there's a guy like that available in the portal and he's interested in Miami and he's interested in playing with Cam Ward, then you got to go for it. Like I think of, you mentioned I'm a Yankees fan. Um, They have Juan Soto this year. He's got a one year contract. So they're all in. Like right. you got what you got one year of this star player. You need to take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, I think receivers definitely a spot they'll look at R- running back. We talked about, I did forget Trevante citizen. Um, I know Mario did say, about citizen last week that like something finally kind of clicked, you know, maybe he's not playing. So, so uh, tepid or tenuous um, and just, you know, full go after coming back from that injury, I can't blame him for, you know, being a little iffy uh, coming back, but um, yeah, DB, like you can get more solid DBs, like the more, the better because they're so depleted there. Um, and like you said, Damari Brown, like there's your FSU uh, homer coming out, uh, wishing him <laughs> to, to FSU, but not at all, <laughs> <laughs> but um. But yeah, I mean, I mean, if he stays, he's a starter on yeah. you know August thirty first. But if he if he decides to leave, that's up to him. He wants to play with his brother at FSU or, or go somewhere else, and obviously that's his call. But um, if he does leave, then UM's in a very precarious position at cornerback because they, I mean, Daryl Porter is a very solid corner, but behind him and Damari Brown, it's like you got Demetrius Freeney, Robert Stafford. I mean, they're running Robbie Washington out at corner a little, you know, a few times just to see what he can do. And I think he's actually pretty decent at cornerback. So maybe they could use him there, but you know, the, the depth uh, goes away very quickly. There's a very shallow at cornerback. So if they lose a guy or two. They're going to have to bring in a couple of guys and they yeah. probably need to bring in a couple of guys regardless, even if no one leaves. But like I guess that's the position that worries me the most for sure. Yeah. Mish Powell has looked good. I think in the slot, I know people have said, well, Xavier Restrepo and Cam Ward keep beating them. Well, Xavier Restrepo and Cam Ward might be one of the best combinations in all of college football they're, this coming they're, season. They're going to beat. They're going to beat a lot of guys this year. Yeah, and and Mish, I think, has been there stride for stride for a lot of those plays. It's just you know the ball gets placed in a great spot. Xavier makes a ridiculous catch. Uh, either way, I mean, if he if you got a solid number one slot corner in today's game of college football and Mish Powell, then you're you're ahead of the game. So that's one position where in the secondary, I'm I'm confident in. But both safety spots. I mean, Jaden Harris, you know, will he ever really? Can he ever really be counted on to be the guy? Jadis Richard at the other corner spot, you know, is he is he a guy uh, that, that could be a number three or is he just too slow? I think at times I think he's looked too slow. Um, and then Savion Riley, yeah, you know, he, he produced a bunch of tackles last year at Vanderbilt. But, hey, you know, can he can he handle a full time job in the secondary or does Miami have to sort of play Zaquan Patterson? Uh, early in his career, both Rogier and Monroe told me they hope that that's not the case. That Patterson looks like a promising young player, but you you also don't want to kill his confidence, right? And that's and that's a danger in starting a true freshman at the safety position. Why you don't really see it happen very often in this game, um, because they're just it's it's one of those tough spots to be in. I think it's a little easier to maybe play a true freshman at corner 
where, where they just got to line up and cover the guy they've got. But to to organize the defense on the back end, it's it's asking them a lot. And I know Patterson is a guy that we all sort of identified as, hey, maybe he could play early. But I think also, you know, the guys have to get in the door. They have to learn. And then it just depends on how quickly they learn. And so, yeah, I, I expect Miami to go out and get some DBs, Adam, and, and to upgrade this roster if they can. Uh, in that perspective, but I like the rest of the roster. Like you, I, I I think you know I like the defensive line. I think the linebacker, the young linebackers have really stepped up. That's something that that both Monroe and um, you know uh, Rogier mentioned to me. They thought the most improved unit on defense was linebacker. What are your thoughts on that unit? Uh, well, the first thing, just when it comes to DBs, I was talking about this with a few other reporters um, a week or two ago. The good thing, maybe maybe the saving grace for the DBs, um, you look at fo- or Miami schedule coming up this year. They don't have any really elite quarterbacks on the schedule. That's true. That's Graham Mertz, DJ Uyunglele, like they don't really have like uh, Tyler Shuck at, at Louisville now, or uh, any big like, time receivers. I would say, yeah, also. they they don't have any superstars there like that they have to face. So like that could be a saving grace. And then I guess the rest of the roster, like I, I like you said, I, I kind of like everywhere. I like the linebackers. Um, I think you know Kiko Maui Noah, really really great player in his first year at Miami, and I he's been out for the spring, but. They expect him to be healthy uh, for the fall. And I think he'll, you know, he's a really good kind of everything you want from like your, your veteran linebacker. He's very good. Um, and he's a, he's a leader on the defense. Uh, very, he's got that, that like that, con- I mean, you know, you got like that confidence, that composure, like yeah. a stand up dude. I, I like him a lot. And then uh, Popo Aguirre uh, stood out in the spring and he's getting a lot of love from the coaches and stuff. Uh, and I like that. And then you asked about like the D line too. Yeah. Yeah, I like the D-line a lot. Like, if everyone's healthy, I think it's a potentially elite unit. Um, they were very good last year with uh, with Reuben Bain, with uh, Jared Harrison Hunt's very solid. Branson Dean's gone, but they brought in two tackle transfers. Um, Marley Cook, who is just maybe the strongest man alive, uh, <laughs> squatting, squatting 700 pounds. I won't say um, how much more that is than me, but it's a it's lot. It's a significant amount. Say, yes. um, most, most of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then, yeah, if Nigel Lee Kelly and Akeem Mesidor are healthy, they're both very good defensive uh, ends. Uh, Mesidor can slide inside if he has to. I, I just think it's an end. You know, there's depth there. You know, we'll see how much the uh, the young guys get a chance to play, whether, you know, Justin Scott comes in in the summer and is able to get on the field quickly or Armando Blunt, although he's super young. I don't know if he'll play too much as a freshman, but he's a talented kid. Uh, they've got a very it's a very deep unit. I really like that that unit for them. Yeah, I I agree. I'm with you. I'm with you there. Uh, I would say the one interesting thing that came out of camp was Mesidor saying he needs a special pair of shoes. Yeah, uh, from Adidas to be able to play this coming season. And uh, I I saw that interview online. I wasn't there at practice yesterday, uh, but I saw that interview and I said, "Wow!" I, I said, "That's what's holding him back." Like Adidas, speed it up, man! Like the guy yeah, could honestly. use some work after <laughs> after only playing in three games last yeah. year. Miami and, really could but- use him. Yeah, and when he's healthy, he is so good. Like, in 2022, he was – I mean, he may have been, like, my defensive MVP in 2022. He was so good, mm-hmm. like, in his first yeah. year at UM. So, if he's healthy, that's a huge, huge addition or a huge boost for them. 100%, yeah. All right, I want to get to the mailbag, but let's talk a little bit of recruiting for a second because I think Miami, if I'm not mistaken, is at five commitments uh, right now. Uh, they did pick up a, a running back commitment out of Sefner Armwood, a four-star blue chipper. Uh, but I kind of call this the silly season, Adam, <laughs> because guys will commit now, and you and I know, uh, that the reality is this: if they're still taking visits, which a lot of these guys are still going to do in the summertime, anything can happen. But for you right now, Wednesday, April 3rd, who are maybe some of the, the recruits that you feel best about when it comes to Miami? I know you've talked to some of these guys. Who among the top the top targets would you say if you had a hunch? Hey, this I, I think Miami's in good standing with this guy. I think Miami's in really good standing with this guy. Who who are some of those guys for you? Um, one guy who I really like is uh, Byron Lewis, the running back out of American Heritage. Uh, he's like a, you know, kind of like a baby Mark Fletcher. I know him and Mark are really, really close. Uh, so I think I really like him. Uh, I know he was just at Miami. I think this past weekend, he's already got his uh, OV scheduled. Uh, I think he he's a guy. I mean, I'm not going to say anyone obviously is is a lock, but um, I think he has a pretty good chance um, at ending up at UF at some point. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I like Nation Montgomery. Um, I don't know how like if he, he's definitely not a lock to Miami, but I, I've seen him play a little bit. He's really solid. Uh, ben Hanks down out of um, see at Booker T. Booker T. Washington. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
talented cornerback, seen him work out a bit. Haven't had a chance to talk to him in a while. Uh, same thing with Cortez Mills, another local guy who I haven't had a chance to talk to lately. But um, from what I've read from other guys, like, you know, likes Miami a lot. Oh, I'm trying to think who else. Well, and he, and, he, and he plays for uh, he plays for uh, the seven on seven team that is basically run by Miami guys. Yeah, so. <laughs> that, helps. That, that doesn't hurt. That, doesn't that puts hurt. him in a good spot. DJ Pickett to me is the most interesting one mm-hmm. because he's the number one recruit in the state, the number one cornerback mm-hmm. in the country. And it's such a position of need that to me, you have his cousin on the team already. Right. You just yeah. signed him. Uh, to me, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to DJ, but when you, you know, last year we sort of all pegged Jeremiah Smith as the most important target for Miami. They didn't get him, but they did get Jojo Trader and they still signed, you know, a top five class. Is there a most important recruit for you? For me, it's DJ Pickett. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. One, because it's a position I need, like you need those DBs. Um, and the other is because he's just so good. Like, mm-hmm. and look, he's got the, the ties to the team already. Like, you really, really want to land a kid like that. Like, it seems like everything is set up for him to come to Miami. It's like laying out the red carpet. So if you don't land a guy like that, like, people take note. Uh, and I'm trying, because I'm trying to think of more guys, like, again, not the most important guy, but um, somebody who stood out to me when I was out at the Under Armour camp um, last month was uh, Floyd Bucard from Miami yeah. Central, Canadian kid. Mm-hmm. Um, not highly touted, like, doesn't have the stars. Uh, right. But he he showed out that day, and uh, he's a local kid now. Now he's a local kid. Uh and I think and I think Miami likes him. That you know he was on campus. I think once or twice. Um, and I I think he's a local kid. That kind of one of those guys who can kind of fly under the radar and step and be a solid pickup down the line. Another guy I would say is really important for Miami is Bryce Fitzgerald, who I did mm-hmm. get a chance to talk to. I drove up to Tallahassee for the state championships in December. Spoke to Bryce. I know uh, you know he's got an official visit lined up in June. Um, I, I think he's an important guy for Miami as well because he, I, I would say he's one of the top local players and certainly mm-hmm. one of the best. He's he's like a legit defensive back who you say, man, Miami wants to improve the safety position, right? They want to they want to get better cornerbacks, etc. This is the kind of guy I think you need to land in this class. So uh, to me, when I think of most important, I think Pickett, you know, from a, from a statewide perspective, and then Fitzgerald, I would say from a local perspective, because I think they're going to get Mills. I think I think they're going to get a big time receiver locally. I think they're going to mm-hmm. get they're going to fill some needs uh, at other spots. But those are the ones that I look at and say, con- you know, in terms of competing for guys, I think those are the guys that they're going to have to fight for and, and win. Those are sort of the big ones that I think they need to win. But again, yeah. it's early. <laughs> yeah. And, li- and like we talked about earlier, like get more, more Florida guys, keep establishing yourself, getting and not just get Florida guys, but get the top Florida guys, like of the top five, 10 guys in the st- ranked in the state, like get a couple of them, three or four or five, as, or as many as you can, but you know, you want to get a few. So you're not just kind of picking at George's leftovers. You know, you don't want to keep, you don't want to do that. No, for sure. All right, let's get to the mailbag questions because we have a bunch of them here, Adam, and I don't want to hold you up. I've already had you on for a while, and I know you've probably got other things to do, but I do appreciate all the time you've given us today. Um, let's start well, here with I, – I got a new puppy who's mercifully been uh, been quiet for this whole recording so far. Maybe <laughs> I jinxed it, but she's sleeping <laughs> on the couch right now. Good, good, good. Uh, and I, and, and, I, and your dogs are beautiful, by the way. I know you've shared some yeah, photos online. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful dogs for sure. They're great. Um, this is from Andrew V seventeen, who's frequently uh, on on the uh, timeline here. Whenever I send out questions, he says, "Do you expect Miami to be really active in the spring portal window, and do you think all five scholarship quarterbacks stay?" Let's start with the second question first, Adam. Your hunch right now: Does Miami have the same five scholarship quarterbacks on the roster come the fall? I lean towards no. I'd say sixty forty no. Um, I I think Jakari Brown, good chance he leaves. Um. Just because, like, you've got Cam Ward ahead of you, you got Reese Parf- Poffenbarger ahead of you, who's also looked good in camp, and yeah. you got Emery Williams behind you, or maybe ahead of you too. I mean, depending on what the coaches exactly think. Uh, I just don't know if he has that that window because I think, I mean, Reese, from what we've seen, has looked very good in camp. Um, obviously, Cam Ward's getting all the attention, but Reese has looked pretty good. I think there's a pretty good chance, you know, he ends up being the starter next year, and then you have Emery, then you have. Presumably Luke Nickel on campus. Then, um, you know who who else, whoever else is committed at that point in the class of twenty twenty six. I mean, looking down the road, but like, it's like, does he have that that timeline? Does it line up for him anymore? I don't know that it does. Uh, I know he's got a nice NIL deal, so he's got well, every incentive helps. to stay. Which is he may not get that in other places, but you know, people did get to watch him right in the pinstripe bowl, and I'm sure there's probably somebody out there willing to 
to take a chance on him. Yeah, he reminds me not necessarily in ability or, or style, but like Anthony Richardson. Like I was saying, Anthony Richardson, when he was leaving Florida going into the draft, I said, there's going to be a, an NFL GM who looks at him and says, I can work with that. <laughs> um, and and that, that GM is either going to, you know, I guess it's Indianapolis, is either going to get, you know, lauded or fired for that choice. Um, same thing with Jakari Brown. Like, like there's going to be coaches out there with, you, who look at his skill set and say, I can make that work. Um, yeah. cause he's got, he's got talent. He's got a big arm. He's, in, he's very fast and athletic. Like there are, there are worse quarterbacks out there with worse skill sets who, who are good. So if he doesn't end up, if he doesn't stick at Miami, um, he'll, he'll find somebody who wants him. And I, I think he has the, the skill set to work and do, and do well, whether it's at Miami and Miami's system of play, I don't know. And like I said, with the kind of the way things are shaping up with the quarterback room, he might be one of those guys where, you know, Mario sits down and says, you know, start looking, start looking for somewhere else. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I think unfortunately that's, that's probably going to be one of those uh, situations where Miami is uh, going to be losing somebody at that position either way. Um, yeah. As you, far you, as five, five quarterbacks, it just, I mean, like when you're in a roster crunch, <laughs> like you don't need five quarterbacks, you need four. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how active do you think they will be how, right now? How many guys do you think they sign in this next Wednesday? Rough number. Oh gosh, you're asking. I was told there'd be no math. Um, <laughs> I'm not a math guy. I, I, I'd have to. I don't know how many scholarships they're at right now. How many they need to drop or they're going to lose guys. I would yeah, say, but... yeah. I mean, I think they're going to be active. I, I don't know if I'd put a number on it, but I think like we talked about, running back, DB are probably the be- biggest positions in need. Um, if they have, if they can get a good receiver, like that's a spot. Um, you can always use depth on the lines. Like that's never a bad idea. I can't put a number on it but i think they'll be active yeah i'm i'm gonna say five just to give it a rough number just to give it a rough number um Mm -hmm. all right this is uh from alex avila uh this is about realignment he says hopefully the everything is fine narrative through the media is bs (laughs) and we are working behind the scenes contentment with the acc is contentment to being a second rate program adam i've had conversations with people at miami about the ACC and what's going on. Um, I think, first of all, there's some common sense being used here. Nothing is imminent, right? Like Florida State and Clemson, unless they get, you know, a surprise decision here pretty soon, um, I think they're they're pretty much stuck here for the next two years. So while Miami is, is maybe saying things like, hey, we love the ACC, I think they're certainly looking into it. Um, what's your read on the situation right now? What do you What is your inkling? Pretty similar. Like, I know I asked uh, Dan Radakovich about it. Um, I think it was shortly after the FSU lawsuit was filed uh, at the Pinstripe Bowl and stuff. And he basically said, I think he said, like, uh, the term he used was, like, we're interested observers or something like that. Like, right. they're going to keep an eye on things. And I don't think, like you said, anyone at my, Miami is naive enough to think the ACC is in amazing shape and nothing bad's going to happen through 2036 and everything's hunky-dory. Um, I don't think anyone thinks that. Like, no one's that naive. Um, but they're also not going to, you know, be the first ones out the door. And that might be the smart thing, like in some ways, because they're not the ones who will spend the money on the lawsuits, who will look silly for filing a lawsuit saying, uh, yeah, we signed that document, but we don't like it anymore. So we, it shouldn't count because um, we don't like it. Um, so they don't look stupid like that. They they don't, you know, get the PR hit, you know, that Clemson might be getting or FSU might be getting for both you know, kind of the silly lawsuits and the mo- being money hungry and every everything that you want to throw at FSU or Clemson for you know trying to leave the ACC. But I think if FSU and Clemson leave, good chance they're out the door um, as well. You know, if the SEC or Big Ten want them, um, I heard an interesting argument. I can't remember what podcast it was on. I'm getting like source amnesia. Talking about the Big Twelve, um, like the Big Twelve had their two big dogs leave in Texas and Oklahoma. They added some other schools. Um, and the, the Big 12 is not in danger really anymore. Like, sure, they're not the Big 10 or the or the SEC, but like they're not in bad shape. They're they're not in shape the same shape as the ACC. Like there no one's pointing at them saying this conference is falling apart. So I wonder though if maybe Miami kind of looks at the Big 12 and is like, if Clemson and FSU leaves, we could be the biggest fish in a smaller pond. Yeah. Which might not <clears throat> if the ACC stabilizes. Um, might not be the worst idea. It might not be the worst thing. And, you know, 
you might get that kind of like automatic spot in the playoff. Like if you're the number one team in the ACC, even if the ACC only gets like two spots in a 12 team playoff, if your team is humming, you might be basically getting an automatic bid to the playoffs every year if you're in a good spot. Yep. So that's a possibility. Too. It may have been your podcast where you were talking about that. I, I don't remember. Um, but it might not be the worst idea to stay in the ACC. But if you can jump ship to the Big Ten or the SEC, it's a pretty good idea. Yeah, I, and, and I'm of the opinion, you know, that you, you look at when Miami thrived, right? First of all, they did it as an independent. And that's where they won four of their national championships, uh, actually three of their national championships. Um, but one, essentially, in the Big East. And I, I think you think about Miami's success, they didn't have really much in the way of competition, right? And I know it's a different era and and, and money is an important issue and, you, you know, paying players, et cetera. Um, I think the only way this really becomes a danger is if Miami's private funding, which apparently they have a lot of, uh, goes out the window, all right? Where all of a sudden they just can't compete with everybody else when it comes to recruiting players. I will say this for the people who are saying you have to go to the Big Ten and the SEC, We've yet to really see what it's like for te Texas and Oklahoma to go through several full seasons in the SEC. We've yet to see what it's like for Oregon and Washington and USC to have to play in the Big Ten and travel cross country to play in those games. There's wear and tear that people don't take account for. I think a lot of people thought, oh, Miami's going to go to the ACC and just kick everyone's ass, right? That Oops. obviously hasn't happened. So I, I think... While we can all sit here and say, hey, changing conferences, Miami has to. This is a must. Maybe it isn't. Maybe they can thrive the way that they did in the Big East by staying in the ACC. And I think ultimately they'll make the smart decision. Um, but I also think they're not just going to rush to judgment and say we have to be in the Big Ten. And if they go anywhere, it'll be the Big Ten. The SEC is not going to want Miami. They've never wanted Miami. Um, so... I think ultimately it's the Big Ten, and does Miami see that as a necessity? If it doesn't happen, if the Big 12 survives, if the ACC survives as is, well, they're in the lesser conference, but hell, there's a there's a spot in the 14-team playoffs in years to come. Yeah, exactly. And I think it was your podcast where I, I'm getting that idea from, where it's like, yeah, being the biggest fish in a smaller pond, not always the bad thing. Like, you can still, if you're getting the talent, and, you know, like you said, South Florida, like Miami, there's no shortage of, of stupid money flying around just in general. Yeah. Like, you get someone to keep investing and stuff like you'll be fine. If even if you're only making 25 million in your TV deal and not 50, you know, you're recruiting. Well, might not be the worst thing. All right. This question is from Von Kane on Twitter. He says running back depth is obviously an issue, but what transfer wood window targets are out there? And the wide receiver room seems to have gone from a weakness to a strength. Is Isaiah Horton really putting it together? Let's go back to running back before we get to Isaiah Horton. Um, for all of you who are listening to this or watching other shopping nowadays includes going to other people's rosters and not necessarily looking at who's in the transfer window. If somebody is still in the transfer window right now, Adam, they're probably not going to be somebody that Miami wants. They yeah, want exactly. guys that are on other people's roster. And so I think we need to wake up to the idea that this is what's going to happen. April 15th, April 30th is going to be a really really scary time for a lot of people in college football because I think you're going to see a lot of really good players switch schools here and it's going to be sort of eye-opening when some really good players at SEC schools decide you know what no I, I yeah I might be a starter here or I might have an important role but these people are giving me a lot more money to come play here yeah and I, I mean honestly I can't blame them like if someone was offering me five hundred thousand dollars to come live in Miami um I can get a studio apartment with that money but um, yeah, I mean, like that's not not the worst thing, you know. So it's gonna be crazy, uh, and like you said, yeah, you know, it's gonna be a lot of, you know, my uncle will call your uncle, and you know, you'll hop in the portal, and twenty four hours later, you'll be at Miami, or you'll be going from Miami to Georgia or Alabama or wherever. It, it's gonna be a crazy period, I think. Um, gonna be keeping me very busy. Gonna be drinking a lot of this coffee, um, <laughs> and be very very active. Um, but yeah, I, I think. Like you said, there's a lot of tampering, not tampering that's happening, and that's for the NCAA to figure out. Isaiah Horton, your believer? I think he could be good. Am I might now how good's the question? I think I don't think he's gonna be a thousand yard receiver. But then again, I didn't really think Xavier Estrepo would be a thousand yard receiver, and he was able to do that in, in that offense last year. So I think, you know, he's probably 
the starting outside receiver this year. And I think I, he looks good in practice. I mean, like we only see so much of practice, you know, like, but for people who don't mm-hmm. know, like when we're in practice, we're watching the first, basically the first half ish, which is a lot of individual drills and then some one-on-ones. So like, right. we don't see the scrimmaging. We don't see the full scrimmages, like which are on Saturdays and stuff like So we don't see that. So it's a little bit harder to know like who is really good and who's not. Um, Horton's looked good. I, I've liked what I've seen from him. I mean, he hasn't stood out maybe in the way that like um, a JoJo Trader or a Nye Carr or Elijah Lofton or even like a Re- Xavier Estrepo uh, messed it out to me. But I'm also like, I just named a couple freshmen. Those are guys who I've got closer eyes on than Isaiah Horton maybe. But I, I think, yeah. you know, I think he looks good. And I think if he gets an opportunity, he's he's flashed the ability to be a solid receiver. So I think he's going to get a shot. I, I wouldn't put myself down in the believer camp, but I'm also not a hater either. So I'm not, my jury is still out on him. Yeah, I, I think he's somebody that the coaching staff really likes, but I also think they are looking for somebody who could they could potentially get that's better at that exactly. big wide receiver position. So right. uh, when you're still looking, that means you're you're not satisfied. Um all right. Over under on touches for Elijah Loft in this season, three and a half. This is from Armando Izagari. Uh, AY2 Mondo on Twitter. Three and a half touches a game for Elijah Lofton. Over or under? What are you betting? I think that's a good line. Um, <laughs> you should work for the Hard, hard Rock app. Um, <laughs> uh, I will hedge and say the under because I think he's a talented player, but I think they've got a lot of tight ends who are going to also be getting time. Um, I think Riley Williams, you know, has gotten a ton of praise. I like Riley Williams as a player. He's also made some really great catches in, in practice that we've seen. Um, so I like him a lot. You know, Cam McCormick is going to get his reps. Elijah Arroyo, if he's healthy, is going to get a ton of time. Um, and I think he could be a very good player. Uh, and th- yeah, and then running back, we've talked about a bunch. Like maybe get some reps there, but or as an H back. So three and a half, three and a half touches, right? Not reps. Right. Okay. So, and then it's a question of just who's open and who's getting the ball and stuff like that. And you know, I so I'll hedge. I'll hedge the under, but I'll I'll say there will be a couple games where he'll go off and have big numbers, you know, eight catches, 90 yards and a touchdown or something. And there'll be some games where he'll he'll have, you know, two catches for 17 yards or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to go over. I think he is going to have a bigger role than we think. I think it'll be five, five touches a game. That's reasonable. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked either. I'm not putting money on that. Uh, All right. On that line. (laughs) Let's go to the next one here. This is from Columbus Kane. Whenever FSU and Clemson leave the ACC, do we have a spot in the Big Two or are we relegated to the Big 12? To me, if we don't get into either Big Two, then the administration will have failed. We kind of touched on this already. Do th- Does Miami have a spot right now? I don't know that Miami has a spot in the Big Ten guaranteed. I don't I don't see, even though they have the AU status uh, and everything that would help them to become a Big Ten school, Big Ten's already a big conference. They just added those four Pac-12 schools, um, you know, I, do they really want to go to 20? I think these are all interesting questions that we really don't have an answer to. Yeah, just, I mean, you really, a conference, you can have a conference that stretches from Miami to Seattle, just the biggest possible 10. Like, yeah, that, that just is ridiculous. Oh, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it's it's possible, but it's just, I mean, I know I'm not, I've not been around college football as long as you or, there's some other people. I have only been watching college football for about 15 years, but like, that's just it. Just seems so ridiculous. I'm not a I'm not a general fan of the conference realignment. All the stuff that's happened in the last couple of years. So just a conference that goes from Miami to Washington is just nuts. Yeah, and I and I think the one thing we have to think about here, unless they're going to sort of kick some teams out, then maybe it makes a little bit more sense because you're slicing the pie, right? You're further slicing that those big payoffs and these schools made this TV deal to make all that money, not to go backwards. So while I think it's certainly a possibility, I think what FSU and Clemson are ultimately fighting for is just the opportunity to go. If it's there, I don't know that anybody has a guaranteed spot. I I have a great idea. How about we do this? Let's, you can add Miami and FSU and Clemson to the big 10 and then, because it's such a big conference, you have to split it up into divisions, and you can have, like, Miami and FSU and Clemson and Maryland and Rutgers and, I don't know, Penn State, and they could be the Atlantic Coast there division of the Big Ten. There you Just, go. There's That makes sense. Ten, look, show me the money, Big Ten. I got, I got all your ideas right here. You're helping them out, man. All right, this is from Connor. A lot of people wrongly criticized Aaron Feld for injuries uh, the first season. 
How have you seen the strength and conditioning progress over the past couple of years? Secondly, might this be the year when the spring Kool-Aid doesn't spoil come the fall? What do you think physically from a, from a Miami perspective? I mean, the offensive line made it through the whole season uh, last year without any serious, you know, time being missed. Uh, receivers were relatively healthy. I mean, where were they banged up? Defensive line, I guess, is really the only spot. Yeah, it was like Akeem Mesador missed most of the year. Nigel Lee Kelly missed most of the year. And then after that, like I'm trying to think, like Tyler Van Dyke was hurt for, you know, the second half of the year, but like Mitt still was able to play. He wasn't, like, he only missed one game due to injury, but he was banged up. Um, I'm trying to think who else missed significant time last year. Like really wasn't that many guys. Cam Kitchens missed two games. And that was a freak kind of thing. With right. that Chavante Citizen and Zion Nelson with their previous injuries. Like... Yeah. So like last year, I mean, injury luck wise, Really good for Miami, but like the thing is, like saying whose fault is an injury, it's like it's so difficult. One, one because it's, it's football; people are going to get hurt. Like it's just a physical game, a violent game. People are going to get hurt, and some people are going to get hurt badly. And then just also with Miami as a program, like with what they don't tell us about injuries or don't you know keep us up to date with, like app- appropriating blame on anyone is like impossible, which is probably how they want it. But um. You know, saying, oh, this guy should have been back sooner because he had a, you know, cold hamstring and he should have been back in three weeks, but he took him five. Like, I don't know. It's football. It's a hard game and violent and everything. I would venture to say, Adam, and and this is, again, there's no scientific evidence. I haven't done any deep research on this. But when you have bigger guys on the offensive and defensive line, which Mario has been recruiting, right? Usually the bigger guys don't get hurt as often as the smaller guys do when you have those big collisions. Yeah. And so it helps, I think, to have more size and girth and bigger bodies. And that's what For Mario sure. has recruited to. Now, look, it's not a perfect science. As you said, you can't lay blame. But I think I just think that's part of the reason maybe why they yeah. were able to get through it. All right. And I'm, this I'm, thing- st- I'm still just one more. No, 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 I'm still amazed that like all five offensive linemen started out 12 games. I don't know if I've ever seen that like from any team. Uh, that's wild. That's just like it, that doesn't happen very it often. It happens. It happens other places, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe right. maybe not at Miami. Think, but, not yeah. at Miami. <laughs> um, this is also from Connor. Uh, might this be the year when the spring Kool Aid doesn't come uh to fall? The spoil, you know, to spoil this Kool Aid. What do you, What do you think? Is this the year that uh, the Kool Aid we drink is is real? Uh, I mean, I'm drinking it. Um, uh, but <laughs> I, I think they're gonna be good. I mean, it depends on how how uh how potent or I don't know laced is your Kool Aid. Um, like, what do you think's gonna happen? Like, if you think this team's winning a national title, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, right. if you think this team can win the ACC and that's your Kool Aid, that's your your Kool Aid dose or or uh, uh potency, then I think that's reasonable. I think that's definitely possible. I mean, I don't yeah. think FSU is gonna be as good. Clemson will be good, but I don't think they're gonna be great. Louisville, I think, will be good, but not great. Like, Miami, I think, will be good, but probably not great. So, when you have a bunch of good teams, like, anything can happen. So, I think if, you're, if your Kool-Aid strength is this team can win a conference title, I think it probably won't go bad. But if your Kool-Aid is telling you that uh, if you're seeing visions of winning the college football playoff, then maybe um, reduce your dosage. Yes. I, I would say uh, Miami will go as far as Cam Ward takes them. Yeah. He's su- if he's super Cam Ward and, and we're talking about him being a first round pick and, you know, this guy having just a phenomenal year, then then Miami's probably going to be where they want to be at the end of the year. So, something that something that nobody's talking about is that Miami is keeping its Cam quota uh, at the appropriate level. They lose Cam Kitchens, but they keep Cam McCormick and bring in Cam Ward. Just keep That's right. It's it's Cam, very Cam's important Cam Elijah's. quota. <laughs> yeah, Cam's and Elijah's. All right. This is uh from Miami Day 305. He says with. Uh, Ja'Kerry Brown having the most upside and overall talent from all the QBs. Do you foresee him being the QB of the future after the season or another quarterback? Well, we just talked about him probably leaving. Uh, I'll say this for the Miami quarterback position. When you go into the transfer portal and get two quarterbacks, sends a pretty strong message to me that they don't think anybody on this team is the quarterback of the future. And I think we all have to start thinking that in college football today, just because you recruit a quarterback as a freshman and he might be a four or five star, whatever he is, he's got to come in and prove that he can handle those responsibilities. And, and, and if your team is continuing to look in the portal, they're not satisfied with what they've got. The, the only caveat I would have for that, for Miami's specific case this year though, is they brought in Reese in that two week period when Cam Ward had declared for the draft, but, hadn't yet changed his mind. So, I mean, I'm, I know there were conversations happening and stuff between Miami and Cam Ward in that period. But if you think, okay, Cam Ward's probably going to the NFL because 
how often do M- or M- uh, players in the NFL draft back out of it? I don't think that happens a ton. It happens more in college basketball. Right. Uh, maybe they bring it. They brought in Reese like as their plan B, and then oh hey, Cam Ward's available again. Like he's changing his mind. You know, maybe that had something to do with it. Where it's like, like we need a quarterback here, and we like this kid, so we'll bring in Reese Poffenbarger. And then oh hey, great, Cam Ward's still available again. Like we'll bring him in. Like, obviously, we're gonna we're not gonna say no. We have Reese Poffenbarger from Albany here. You can't come. We don't have a spot for you. So that might be an added complication to it. Um. Maybe they didn't, if you ask them on December 15th, do you want to bring in two quarterbacks or one? I maybe have a better insight into it than I do, but if you ask them on December 15th, do they want to bring in one quarterback or two? I don't know if they what their answer would be, whether it would be one or two uh, based on what they already had and stuff. So right. that could be an added thing as well. That's, I don't fair. Know. That's fair to bring up. I, I just think ultimately this idea of quarterback of the future is, is dead because if you can upgrade – that's what the transfer portal has done. It's basically eliminated it. Like, unless you're getting the five-star quarterback, right? Unless you're getting an Arch Manning or a Quinn Ewers or somebody that you're just going to, hey, this is who we're marrying ourselves to, um, then, you know, I, I just don't think that happens anymore. I think there's a better option available to transfer. It's it's just, it's upgrading, right? We're upgrading this year. We, we like the guy we have, but we're going to go ahead and upgrade because coaches just don't have the patience anymore. They want to win and it, they take a sort of different approach. For sure. Yeah. You're not, you're not marrying, you're not, you're not holding a spot hundred percent for an Emory Williams or a Judd Anderson saying, this is the guy. Um, yeah. Like I said, unless it's like a Trevor Lawrence or kind of, you know, level guy, you're not reserving a spot for them. If they have, if they develop the way that you want them to, then sure. Great. But mm-hmm. you know, when they're two years away from being the quarter, you know, the starting quarterback, probably you can't in this, in college football, like you said, this, in this day and age, you can't say, this is our guy in two years, hundred percent. No, no change to the plan. I agree. Um, all right. Last question. Cause we, we got to get out of here. We've been recording for a while now. And I, again, I appreciate all the time you gave me, Adam. Yeah, this, no is, problem. this is from Michael Bonasar M bones 12 on Twitter. Before he got hurt, word was Trevante citizen was the most game ready freshman running back we had in a while. He was supposed to be what Fletcher was last year, if not better. Will he ever get back to that level, or is he destined to be a backup slash transfer? I'm of the opinion, Adam, and you can jump on this right after I, I give my short take on this. I'm of the opinion, and I was told this a year and a half ago, that Javante Citizen will probably never play football again. Now, he's come back and obviously played football, but I think the point is he had a serious, serious knee injury to the point where it could totally affect his career. And I think the fact that we're talking about Miami going in and potentially finding a running back in the transfer portal speaks volumes about what the coaching staff and the people here at the program think about their running back situation. So I just think, uh, unfortunately, yes, Trevante Citizen was somebody Miami absolutely loved coming out of high school, but he got a helmet to the knee and it was a bad injury and and it cost him two seasons and some guys never recover from that. Yeah, and, and we'll see if, if Trevante is able to recover from that. Like, I mean, he's, like you said, like, back on the field. But, like, I, I hope to see him in the game. I really do. I, I mean, I've spoken to him a couple of times now at, like, media days the last two years. Uh, I think he said last year it's, like, it was his ACL, LCL, and hamstring. And it's, like, I don't even know how that happens. Like, that's crazy. Um, I guess a helmet to the knee is how that happens. But, um, yeah, I mean, I really I, – I want the best for him. Like, he's a good kid. I talked to him. I remember talking about, like, how um, – like his family made it through uh, Hurricane Laura, I think it was in, in Louisiana and like how he was helping like pick through rubble and stuff like after the hurricane and stuff like that, like good kid. So I, I hope he does stay and does do well, like I'm rooting for him. But um, yeah, it's just he will see how he, you know, he has another week and a half of spring practice to prove himself to the staff that he can be a, a, a contributor. Um, like I said, I mentioned earlier, Cristobal said, um, I think last week that um like something clicked for Trevante in practice and that he was running with that, that force and that kind of power that you want from running back. Cause if you're a running back, you can't run with hesitation and everything, you know, you can't be worried about hurting your knee again and, and have success at running back. And I guess that I can't blame him for being hesitant or being tepid um, given what he's gone through. But if, if he can't get over that at some point, then Miami's going to look for another running back. They're going to look for someone to take his spot. Uh, as unfortunate as that is. Um, but like I said, I, I do hope that he is able to regain that form um, and, and get on the field for Miami. I was really hoping to see him on the field last year because he dressed out for a few games. I was hoping to see him and see him get a carry 
just to say he'd done it because that's just devastating knee injury. Well, he, but... he was he was eligible to come back for the bowl game. They, yeah. they were planning yeah. to get him some work, but I think once Mark Fletcher got hurt, it was sort of like, well, <laughs> this turf isn't great. We don't want to risk losing another guy. Yankee Stadium, most beautiful football field in the in the nation, obviously. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I, I'm I'm rooting for him. I hope I hope to see him on the field this year. You know, at Miami or at or somewhere else. Like I I do like I I want to see him uh, succeed. All right. He is Adam Lichtenstein of the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Make sure that you subscribe to the Sun Sentinel. Read all of Adam's excellent work. Uh, phenomenal job on the podcast today, Adam. I had fun talking to you. Felt, felt like we had a good conversation. My wide right listeners are happy because I finally did a podcast and it's been almost a month since <laughs> I had one. Carlos Leather will be back at some point. He's busy in tax season. He's a lawyer and, and doing tax work. Uh, in fact, I've got an appointment with him to do my taxes this Friday, Adam. So I will see Carlos oh, again for the first time in weeks. Procrastinating on that. Yeah, we are. We, we are dragging ass, as they like to say, when it comes to doing the taxes. For no reason either. It's just we're lazy. We've got soccer, kids' soccer games yeah. and practices and all kinds of other stuff that we've been that we've been busy with. So uh, but listen, thanks for coming on. It was it was fun. I think, uh, you know, you do a phenomenal job covering the Canes. Hopefully people will thank you. will c- continue to read you and, and, and all of your fine work and everything you do. And hopefully you get your own podcast here soon. Right. That's what we're hoping for one of these days. Yeah, maybe. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. For Adam Lichtenstein, I'm Manny Navarro of The Athletic. That's that, That's it for today's episode. I'm guessing we'll be back with more here. Uh, spring game again, April 13th. I don't know if we'll have one before the spring game or after, but uh, we will have more wide right down the road. Talk to you soon.